Okay, morning, everyone. Um, so continuing on with the biological arguments for there being a genetic basis to personality, we already talked about temperament, so I'm not going to say too much about it, but it's important again to bring up because just the very fact that there are differences in behavioral styles that emerge so early is a pretty good source of evidence for there being a genetic basis to personality, right? The fact that even at an early age, infants respond differently to the same experiences and to the same stimuli. Um, so particularly activity, emotionality, impulsivity, sociability, a lot of these temperament traits that we already looked at, right? These differences emerge pretty early and then they get more and more, um, you know, robust, if you like, in terms of how different they are as one gets older. Um, so also remember, we talked about the stability of temperament, right? It doesn't guarantee that, you know, if you're a shy infant, you're going to be a shy child and a shy teenager and so on, but it certainly makes it more likely, right? It's a predisposing factor. And as we saw, people don't really go from one extreme to the other, right? In Jerome Kagan's study, remember, you know, the fearful children never, none of them grew up to be fearless when they were older at any point, right? And none of the fearless infants ever grew up to be um, completely fearful, right? They maybe, they maybe became more average in terms of their personality, but they didn't go from one extreme to the other. And there are other longitudinal studies also that show the stability of temperament. Um, so in one study here, we have three-year-old children rated um, in terms of their inhibition. And again, that was able to predict impulsivity levels um, 15 years later when they're measured again at age 18. Now, what I briefly just want to do is talk about the temperament traits in relation to the big five. So, you know, we've been focusing a lot on the big five as that's the most prominent personality model. How might temperament traits help predict certain scores on this big five model? So with extroversion, even as young as three years old, again, looking at signs of sociability, signs of social confidence, but also signs of enthusiasm, positivity, you know, so a wide range of characteristics to do with extroversion have been shown to then predict extroversion levels um, even 20 years later. Um, and there's a good review by Shiner and D. Young. It's actually a chapter in a book, uh, but it can still be found pretty easily online. Um, but it's a, a good review over how temperament relates to the big five. And what they point out is, you know, when we look at the aspects of extroversion, remember the one is to do with assertiveness, social assertiveness. And they argue that this probably doesn't become a more prominent part of extroversion until one reaches puberty, until the teenage years. Okay, Before that, the most prominent aspect of extroversion is probably the enthusiasm aspect, right? the aspect to do more with sociability and positivity. Neuroticism also can be predicted using a wide range of characteristics, basically a, ra a range of negative emotions, right? Whether one is irritable, moody, fearful, showing signs of inhibition, sadness, you know, again, a wide range all have been shown to predict higher levels of neuroticism later in life. Um, and if we, you know, look at the difference in the aspects between the um, withdrawal aspect and the volatility aspect, we talked about the fact that the withdrawal aspect um, is more to do with the behavioral inhibition system being more sensitive last time, right? Whereas the volatility aspect, okay, has been tied more to a flight, fight, freeze system that's tilted more towards a fight response. Um, well, in terms of why a wide range of neuroticism scores or signs of neuroticism early in life predict neuroticism at the big five level, um, Shiner and D. Young argue it's probably because if we look at negative emotion in terms of emotional intensity, in terms of irritability, in terms of moodiness, that will predict the volatility aspect of neuroticism, right? That's what that's tied to. Whereas if we predict the fearful 
inhibited uh, temperament type, then that's going to predict higher scores in the, this withdrawal aspect of neuroticism. And then we, you know, we also talked about how last time neuroticism's been tied to a more reactive amygdala. Um, and in temperament studies, it's been found the same that you know children who score higher in these negative emotions, these signs of negative temperament, they also have a more reactive amygdala. Okay, so again, showing that you know the biological foundation is similar also. So extraversion neuroticism, certainly the two that can be most well predicted. Okay, based upon temperament scores. The conscientiousness has also been predicted using a wide range of markers from persistence and to less impulsivity to more um, control over one's impulses. Okay, so if one is able to keep focused on a given task without being easily distracted, and even when it's challenging, they're able to persist, that predicts to an extent higher conscientiousness later when one is older. And then also a number of possible precursors to openness. Um, so these include attentional focusing, perceptual sensitivity. But a lot of the researchers in this field argue that openness is better predicted based upon signs of cognitive exploration, cognitive abilities, IQ. Okay, these things early in life are actually better predictors of openness rather than you know particular temperament traits or behavioral styles. Um, and then what about agreeableness? Certainly on the low end of agreeableness, right, is more antisocial, even aggressive behavior if we're at the extremely low end. If we look at aggressiveness early in life, okay, it emerges pretty early, even within the first year of life, but even two-year-olds show very high signs of overt aggression, okay? This can be biting, hitting, kicking, hitting other children with their toys and so on. Okay, two-year-old children actually show more signs of overt physical aggression than any other age group. Um, but the vast majority of these physically aggressive two-year-olds become socialized by the time they're five years old. Okay, by the time they're told, you know, no one wants to play with you if you don't, if you don't share, if you're hitting other children with your toys, they will want to play with you, you'll be excluded, you'll be ostracized and so on. The vast majority of these children become socialized and so are no longer aggressive by five years old. So the early signs of aggression are not very stable. Okay. It's not until we get to five years of age, okay, that then signs of aggression then become stable. So if we're looking at temperament before that, it's not really showing us anything that we can use to predict later signs of aggression or antisocial behavior. Yeah. And you know, if you're in my friends at class, we go into this a lot in a lot more detail. Um, but you know, Patterson's model is the most um, favorable model here in terms of how antisocial behavior develops and why it becomes stable after five years of age. And the main part of that model is that if one isn't socialized by the time they go to school, they're then ostracized by the peer group, and then they're not privy to you know, a lot of the social development learning that comes from being part of a peer group, you know, picking up on social cues, developing understanding of social dynamics, picking up on empathy, um, and so on and so on. If one isn't part of the social group because they're being ostracized for being aggressive, um, then they'll fall behind in terms of their social development, and then that contributes to further aggressive tendencies. So just putting all this together, remember in D. Young's model, we have um, the two meta traits, and then below this, we have the five, um, big five factors, right? So if we look at how temperament maybe predicts each of these, I've shown it in terms of Mary Rothbart's model that we looked at earlier in the course, which is the most popular model now of temperament. And then also the temperament traits, okay, that were part of Roy Martin's model and that were observed in the New York Longitudinal Study, okay. So, you know, extraversion very clearly is predicted by surgency in Mary Rothbart's model. Um, and also then some 
facets of surgency at a lower level, some characteristics of surgency like positive anticipation. Um, in terms of temperament traits, in terms of Roy Martin's model, it would be low shyness, high activity, the best predicts later extroversion. Um, whereas when it comes to openness, Roy Martin argues that cognitive abilities predict this better than any particular temperament traits. Um, and, Roy, and Mary Rothbart's model, th there isn't such a clear one-to-one um, -one relationship with temperament traits and openness. But again, aspects of surgency um, somewhat predict higher openness scores. Um, if we look at neuroticism, right, negative affect very clearly predicts this um, at, in, Mary, in Mary Rothbart's model. Okay. And they're one on one in terms of the relationship, really. Okay. It's not really getting us a lower level insight. Whereas using Roy Martin's model, there is differences in terms of the predictions and aspect scores, right? So we have a child maybe who's low in activity and who's very incredibly shy. That would predict highness in the withdrawal aspect, right, of neuroticism. Um, whereas if we have a child who's highly emotional in terms of, you know, the intensity of their emotions and who are also not very adaptable, then that predicts the volatility aspect, okay, of um, neuroticism. Um, conscientiousness clearly predicted by effortful control in Rothbard's model. In Roy Martin's model, it would be low distractibility, high persistence. That would be the temperament traits. And then with agreeableness, low emotionality, high adaptability would best predict agreeableness using Roy Martin's temperament traits. Um, but, it, but it's not the strongest association. Okay, It's only picking up on some aspects of agreeableness. Um, and again, in Mary Rothbard's model, some aspects of surgency okay, are going to be what best predicts um, high agreeableness. And then, you know, if we're talking about there being a genetic basis to, to personality, we, of course, have to talk about studies on genetics, right? Looking at how heritable um, personality actually is. So just a few terms to understand, first of all, so, you know, a genome referring to the complete set of genes that a person possesses, right? People are thought to have somewhere between 20,000, 30,000 genes. Um, and then heritability is the statistic that we use to explain how much of the observed variance and a given characteristic is due to genetics, right? So in this example, it would be with a personality trait and how much of the observed differences, observed variance is due to genetics, okay? And there's different ways of calculating heritability. The simplest way, um, you should have told me the other thing isn't on. Um, the simplest way is in identical twin studies, okay? If they're reared apart at birth, okay? Because if we have identical twins, then that means that they share about 100% of their genetic makeup, okay? And if they're reared apart at birth, so perhaps adopted into different families, that means they're raised in completely different environments, right? So therefore, in theory, any, any similarity between them should be due to the shared genetics because they didn't share an environment, right? So in those cases of identical twins reared apart at birth, we can take a correlation between them as a direct um, marker of heritability. Okay, so if the correlation, for example, extroversion is 0.6, then that means the heritability score is 0.6 and 60% of the variance is due to genetics. Okay, and then the environment would be explaining the remaining 40%. And so that's the simplest measure of heritability. Um, you know, maybe you've heard of these terms of genomes and um, or uh, genotypes rather than phenotypes. Um, you know, the phenotype is influenced by the genotype, but not necessarily entirely reflective of it because a phenotype is also influenced by the environment. Okay. Whereas when it comes to a genotype, you know, a good example is your eye color is determined by genetics, right? It doesn't matter the environments in which you grow up in, okay, your eye color will remain the same, okay? 
So it's a very clear genotype. Um, whereas a phenotype is things like heights, weights, personality, okay, things that are influenced by genetics, but are also influenced by the environments, okay. Um, another example is a flamingo's feathers, right? The color of a flamingo's feathers. Obviously, a genetic predisposition to be pink, okay? But actually, how vibrant the pink is, is largely determined by their diet, okay? How much they eat. So it's a phenotype because it's influenced by genetics and environmental factors, okay? This is just a case study, but it's to illustrate just how similar um, identical twins can be and the influence possibly of genetics on personality. Um, if you're familiar with the show from the 80s called Unsolved Mysteries that ended in the early 2000s, you know, they did a two hour special on identical twins who were separated at birth and then found each other much later in life. And there was a number of striking similarities between them you know, same jobs that they had taken, an amazing number of similar life events. Um, but my favorite example is the example of the gym twins. Again, identical twins who were reared apart at birth, didn't know about each other, didn't discover each other until about 39 years of age. And again, struck by the number of similarities, okay? Similar jobs. They had both had a dog that they had named the same name. They had both been married twice. Both of their ex-wives had the exact same names. They had both had a son that they had named the same name. They both smoked and both smoked the same um, brand of cigarettes. Um, overall, an amazing number of similarities, okay? And so, of course, this got the attention of psychologists who wanted to have them complete a number of personality assessments. And again, the number of similarities were really overwhelming. Um, in one projective test, for example, you know, so, you know, in projective tests, the stimuli is ambiguous, right? And still the results were very similar. So in one example, they were told to write a story and they could write any story they would like. And the stories that each of them wrote were actually very, very identical. Um, now, they weren't identical in every single way, right? One, one was better with grammar in their writing than the other. They styled their hair differently. But overall, the number of similarities were really, really um, striking. Now again, it's one example. We don't put, you know, we don't take too many conclusions from one from one case, but it's you know posing an interesting question over just how much our genetics have to do with who we are as people. And in family studies, you know, we can we can test this, we can assess this because we know how genetically similar people are, okay, and then we can compare how similar people are in terms of their personality and then see if the genetic similarity has any relationship, right, with how similar they are in personality. So in theory, if there is a strong genetic component to personality, you should be more similar in personality to those you're more genetically similar to than those you're less similar to, right? And so, for example, you know, you share about 50% of your genetic makeup with your parents, as well as your siblings, so long as they're non-identical twins. Um, by the time we get to grandparents, it's about 25%. By great-grandparents, about 12.5%. Um, you know, by time of first cousins twice removed, it's about 3%, okay? But, you know, if we were just comparing similarity, you know, based upon relationships, then the obvious limitation is that those you're more genetically similar to are also those you're more likely to share an environment with, right? And so then would be the question of whether it was the environmental influence or whether it was the genetic influence. So, you know, a simple study like that wouldn't allow us to separate, okay, the influence from genetics from the influence from environment. And so that's why the very best family studies are twin studies and adoption studies, okay? Twin studies and adoption studies are the two types of family studies that do allow us to separate the difference the from the influence on the influence from genetics from the influence from the environment okay now the most common type of twin studies is comparing identical twins to non-identical twins okay identical twins or monozygotic twins come from the same fertilized egg they share about 100 percent of their genetic makeup 
whereas non-identical twins are just like any other siblings, okay? They share about 50% of their genetic makeup um, or fraternal twins. Um, and, you know, we can then compare how similar identical twins are on average to how similar non-identical twins are on average. And if there is a large genetic component to personality, we should find that the identical twins are substantially more similar than the non-identical twins, right, in terms of their personality. A, a problem that's sometimes brought up with this type of study is the equal environment assumption, which is that we are assuming that the, ex the environmental experience of identical twins will be no more similar than that experienced by non-identical twins. Now, certainly, identical twins are more likely to be dressed the same than non-identical twins. So you may argue they're more likely to be treated the same. And so this, you know, similar environments that they're experiencing more so than non-identical twins might be contributing to similarities in personality. Um, but overall, I would say there's pretty little evidence, okay, that identical twins are actually treated more the same the non-identical twins are. So in this type of study, you know, we have the monozygotic twins. We can look at their correlation minus the correlation between the um, fraternal twins. Okay. And then by timesing this, this is one other way of working out heritability. Okay. Um, like I said, the best way of doing it is looking at identical twins reared apart at birth, okay, and then seeing their correlation. But obviously, there isn't very many of those studies. Those are hard studies to come by, okay, because finding participants who are identical twins who are separated at birth, okay, is going to be very, very difficult. So what's the results of um, twin studies? You know, there's many of these um, Bouchard has probably done more research in this than anyone else. His best known study is the Minnesota Twins study because that did contain a number of identical twins separated at birth, okay? Um, it was an important study because the, the results were very surprising. You know, he looked at a number of characteristics and even things like conservatism and traditionalism had extremely high scores of heritability, which before that, people had assumed were basically entirely determined by your environment, that your genetics had nothing to do with it. But, you know, the heritability for some of these characteristics were as high as 0.6. Um, and in terms of personality traits, you know, overall, very, very similar between these identical twins who were separated at birth. Uh, but like I say, most of the research is comparing identical twins to non-identical twins. And in fact, yes, identical twins are more similar than non-identical twins, usually about twice as similar, okay, than non-identical twins. Um, so just as an illustration of this from one of the studies looking at the big five, you know, we have in green, the identical twins and the orange, the non-identical twins. So obviously the larger the gap, the more the genetic influence, right? The higher the heritability. Um, so we're seeing for openness and extroversion and neuroticism especially, very high heritable scores, right? High heritability in this particular study. There's a large difference here between how similar the identical twins are versus how similar the non-identical twins are. It's still a substantial difference in conscientiousness and agreeableness, but it's noticeably smaller, right, than the other three um, big five traits. Um, another example, and um, this time by a different researcher by Reinman. So again, we're finding, you know, correlation scores that are about twice as high for the identical twins than the non-identical twins. Again, especially, you know, high um, differences in neuroticism. This time we're also finding higher differences in conscientiousness. Um, but I'll, I'll, you know, I'll come back to the general takeaways, but certainly from these studies, identical twins usually about twice as similar um, than non-identical twins. So that's twin studies, and then adoption studies are the other best family study to look at heritability. So you know, in these studies, 
we have children who are, of course, adopted, you know, pretty much as soon as they're born. And then later in life, we, you know, give them a personality questionnaire. And we also give a personality questionnaire to their adoptive parents and one to their biological parents. And then we see who are they more similar to? Are they more similar to their adoptive parents or their biological parents? And obviously, if there is a strong genetic basis to personality, then they should be more similar to the um, biological parents. And in fact, that is what we find, okay, across the board when it comes to adoption studies and when it comes to different measurements and different personality traits. Adopted children are more similar in terms of their personality to their biological parents than they are to their adopted parents, okay. Um, in some cases, especially when it comes to sociability, okay, um, the correlation between adopted children and their adoptive parents can be as little as zero, okay. So in, in this study here by Lowline, there was a number of different measurements of sociability used, okay. And in every case, okay, extremely low, in some cases as low as zero, okay similarity and sociability between the adopted children and their adoptive children. So especially when it comes to sociability, there's no real evidence, okay, that the sociability of the, the parents who raise you, assuming they're not also your biological parents, really has any impact on how sociable you are as an individual, okay? That's more influenced by genetics. Now, overall, what twin studies and adoption studies tell us is that on average, 50% of the variance is explained by, per, by um, genetics, okay? It differs somewhat for, you know, each personality traits, extroversions, more like 60%, okay? But on average, for personality, 50% of the variance, 50% of the observed differences is due to genetics, and the remaining 50% is due to environmental factors, okay? So... Um, the nature nurture debate, therefore, is basically come out as a tie, right? Both nature and nurture have a large part to do with who you are as an individual. In some cases, nature might play more of a role. In some individuals, nurture might play more of a role, okay? But if, on average, it's about 50 50 in terms of their influence on personality development. So if genetics are explaining 50% of the variance in personality, that means the environment is explaining the other 50%. But we can break the environment down in terms of that which is the shared environment and that which is the non-shared environment. And so what I mean by that is that which is shared by siblings versus that which is non-shared. So the parenting styles and the parent the personality traits of your parents, the town you grew up in, assuming you don't move, you know, all of these are shared environment factors because they're shared by all the siblings, right? Non-shared environment factors would be, for example, your peer group, assuming you have different peers yeah. than your than your siblings, um, different teachers, perhaps, you know, other unique experiences, differences in life experiences that you have that your siblings don't have or that they have that you don't have. Now, for a long time, it was just assumed that the shared environment is more important, okay? That, for example, the parenting styles and so on of your parents are one of the biggest contributors to personality. But once this was actually looked at, once researchers actually began separating the influence from the shared environment from the influence of the non-shared environment, it was found that the non-shared environment was actually more important than the shared environment. Okay. Now, Zuckerman in the early 90s was really one of the first to raise this issue, but subsequently it's been supported again and again and again. And, you know, by this point, after decades and decades of these sorts of studies, we have, you know, millions of participants in these, in these research studies collectively. Um, and again, they're all pointing in the same direction, okay, regardless of what type of twin study it is or what adopt or if it's an adoption study. Again, the results are pointing in the same direction, okay, that the environment explains about 50%, but within that, the non-shared environment explains more than the shared environment, and then genetics explain the remaining 50%, okay. Okay, um, a few other terms just to 
be familiar with. Okay, we have um, a genotype environment interaction, which is referring to the fact that people respond differently to the same situation based upon differences in genetics. So the, the a clear example of this is difference is between extroverts and introverts, right? We looked at that last time that there seems to be some genetic basis to extroversion and extroverts and introverts respond differently to the same situations because of their differences in genetics, right? Introverts are more bothered by background noise. They're more overstimulated by caffeine, right? And so on. So all of these are examples of genotype environment interactions, okay? And then a genotype environment correlation is the notion that your genetic influence is going to correlate with your environmental exposures or your environmental experiences, right? They're going to be related, okay? They're going to correlate. So for example, you know, maybe you have a parent who wants their child to grow up appreciating books and wanting to be curious about the world and wanting to learn. Yes, there's going to be some genetic predisposition passed on to be curious and to be intellectual and so on. But also that child is probably going to be raised in a household in which there's plenty of books and the parent is probably going to read to them more so than the average parent does. So the, the child is experiencing both of these experiences, right? So they're experiencing both the biological influence and the environmental influence. So there's going to be a clear correlation between these experiences or these influences. Now, the example I just showed you is a passive correlation. The child did nothing to evoke the environmental experience and the child did not actively select the environmental experience. It was passively passed on, okay? An example of a reactive correlation is when the child does something to evoke, okay, the environmental impact. So for example, maybe the child has a very difficult temperament that makes them, you know, very irritable and keeps the parent up all night, okay? And then because of this intense emotional temperament that the child has, maybe the parent becomes less patient and becomes more irritable. It impacts their parenting style, okay? And then in that case, the child has evoked, okay, this environmental impact from the parents via their temperament. And then an active correlation is when the child actively selects the environmental experience, okay, that's congruent with their genetic makeup. So for example, maybe you're genetically predisposed to be thrill-seeking, then you're going to select out experiences like, you know, um, roller coasters and um, skydiving and, you know, a bunch of experiences that will give you this kind of adrenaline rush, right? Okay, so just to make sure you're understanding that, let me give you some examples and tell me if it's passive, reactive, or active, okay? Um, so, you know, if they select it, it's active, right? If they evoke it, it's reactive. If they don't select or evoke it, then it's passive. So for example, Sam's parents both have a liking for sweets, which he inherits. From a young age, his parents fed him lots of sweet foods. Sam's unhealthy eating is an example of which type of correlation? Sorry? Yeah, passive, right. So he's, he's passively getting the genetic and environmental impact. Okay, Claire inherited a liking for sweet foods. Whenever she gets the chance, she goes out to eat at a restaurant with lots of desserts. Her unhealthy eating is an example of which correlation? Active, right? She's actively selecting it. And then Bill's parents dislike sweet foods, but find he refuses to eat any other foods. They explore many options, but Bill has a fussy and emotional temperament. He refuses all other options. And so they settle on just giving him sweet foods because it's all he'll eat. That's an example of our reactive, right? He's actually evoking this environmental experience. Okay. Okay, so... Um, what I lastly want to talk about is the evolutionary arguments, okay? And how that might explain differences in personality. Um, so, you know, natural selection means that through our, our evolutionary history, right? 
adaptations to survival problems have been selected. Okay, so you know, in this room, you all have characteristics that have been passed on by ancestors, and you know, those ancestors were able to beat all the odds, right? So they were able to survive in many cases under very harsh conditions when food was hard to come by and so on. Okay, so you contain you know those characteristics that helped those past ancestors survive their experiences and their conditions, right? Those who didn't survive didn't live long enough to get to reproductive age and didn't live long enough to pass on their genetics material. And so those characteristics, no, they, they didn't live on, okay? Um, let me give you a, a, an example, maybe, just to illustrate what I'm talking about in terms of evolution. So, you know, maybe we have a population of anteaters and they're all, you know, eating ants from underground easily. And then suddenly the ants wise up and the ants decide to go further underground. What's going to happen? The anteaters with the shorter tongues will go hungry and they'll die out. They won't live on to reproductive age, okay? And they won't pass on their genetic material. The anteaters with the longer tongues, they'll survive. They'll manage to keep getting fed and they'll live to reproductive age and pass on their genes. Now, from one generation to the next, the difference won't be noticeable, right? But it will accumulate. And so eventually, a few generations later, you have an entire population of anteaters with tongues substantially longer than that of a few generations ago, right? Um, and now, the adaptations we're talking about could be due to problems with you know, selecting food. It could also be to do with helping us get away from predators, okay? So intelligence, creativity, these are also examples of adaptations, right? Because being high in these traits or having these traits helped our ancestors come up with problems or come up with solutions rather to problems regarding their survival. So, you know, this can help us explain many characteristics, um, including the ones I've just discussed, but you know, opposable thumbs. There are, of course, byproducts of adaptations, right? We haven't evolved to drive a car specifically, right? It's not the case that those who couldn't drive a car died out. It's the case that it's a byproduct of the cognitive abilities, okay, that we've evolved to develop. Um, and this would also explain why there's variation, right? Why there's variability. Because under certain circumstances, some characteristics were beneficial and advantageous. Under some other experiences, okay, other traits and other characteristics were advantageous, which is why then there is variation, right? But also it's to the, the benefit when it comes to the survival of the species that there is variation, right? When the Black Plague spread across Europe, you know, nearly half of Europeans died. Why did the other half survive? Because they were immune, right? So there was variation in the immune system, okay, which meant that the species could survive. Um, and then also sexual selection has something to do with this as well, right? So when it came to the peacock's feathers, for example, you know, Darwin didn't say that that was a product of natural selection. It was a product of sexual selection. The, the peacock with the brightest feathers was more likely to be selected by a mate, and so they were more likely to reproduce, okay? So if we're, if we're arguing that evolution can help explain personality, then not only do we have to explain how personality traits might have benefited us from an evolutionary perspective, okay, aided in our survival, we also have to explain why there might be variation. Right. Um, let me come back to that, but I'll pose you the question of whether you can come up with some reasons, okay, as to why personality traits might have aided in our survival. Okay. Other than personality traits, some other examples of adaptations are the intense need to belong to a group that people feel, right? It can feel very uncomfortable to be ostracized, to be the odd one out, okay? often why people quite easily conform and give into peer pressure. From an evolutionary perspective, this would be easy to explain because we were more likely to survive if we were part of a group, right? 
you were more likely to be picked on by predators if you were alone. Okay, we see this in other animals as well, right? In a herd of zebra, for example, you know, one lion goes after one zebra, another lion goes after another zebra, and so on. Okay, the zebras are able to escape. But if there's something about a zebra that makes them stand out, you know, a dodgy leg or a cut or something such as that, then every lion goes for that one zebra. Okay, and so then that zebra is history. Um, you know, a preference for fatty, sugary foods. Why would we have this? Because it helped us survive harsh winters, right? Managed to help us store on fat and so on. Okay, so then how do we explain um, personality, okay, from an evolutionary perspective? So I'll give you a few minutes, or just a couple of minutes, to write down a reason, at least, for each of the big five traits, okay? You can discuss it with your neighbors if you want. Um, so, you know, extroversion in light of a behavioral activation system, how might have this helped us from an evolutionary viewpoint? Neuroticism or a behavioral inhibition system. Openness, remember, seen as an exploratory system. Agreeableness, which might be associated with cooperativeness. And then conscientiousness, I'm giving you less help with. Okay. So see if you could write down you know, these five benefits, okay? One for each of these traits. Right, okay, I'll open it up, see what you have. Um, so for extroversion, first of all, how might this help us um, from an evolutionary viewpoint? Yeah, Margot. Um, you might want to make four more and find new like territories and resources, like to find new like like to get food or new like places to live and stuff. Okay, maybe more tied to openness because yeah. that's more explorative, right? But yeah, yeah. Sure, maybe so having more about social confidence, more sociability, more social assertiveness might help with mating. Yeah, that's a good that's a good idea. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. And we're still a very social creature, so um not to take away all of our extravagant extraversion and not be able to like to properly communicate to cause hmm. like a lot of problems or this person mental. Okay, so I, I guess those who were able to communicate better may have came up with more ideas and so on, and that may have helped from an evolutionary viewpoint. Yeah, okay. Um, what about neuroticism? Anyone? Yeah. Right, so in some cases, it can be good to be anxious about something, right? Because it means you're going to, Stay away from it. Okay. So that can obviously help with survival. Yeah, sure. Um openness. Um, so we've had like exploring new places, which might mean coming across new resources. Any anything else? Yeah. Right, it's good. So they're more creative, they're gonna come up with new solutions to problems and things. Yeah, great. Um agreeableness. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that kind of mutual altruism can help, especially in some environments in which food is hard to come by, right? And then it, your survival basically depends upon you having to share with other people. Did you have something else? Mm. Right, yeah, so that cooperation is necessary. Yeah, good. Okay, and then maybe conscientiousness is maybe the hardest one, but did anyone have any ideas for this? Yeah. I just said, like, they come to survival. Like, part of surviving is. Okay, why do you think that might be tied to conscientiousness? Okay, okay, yeah. Did someone have their hands up here? Yeah. Um, 
Okay, yeah, they're more industrious, so more kind of working towards a goal. Maybe that means they're more persistent when it comes to problems or challenges. That's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Maybe again, that's maybe more tied to openness. Okay. Being kind of open to new places and new experiences. Yeah. Anything else? So, yeah. I was thinking more of like a routine. So, like when it's dark, you go to sleep, and then when it's light, you, you work and like you follow a pattern and develop a civilization. Right. Good. So, you know, with high openness, sometimes it can be good to come up with new ideas, but sometimes sticking to what works means that you're going to be more likely to survive. If it's um, more likely you'll stick to a routine, that could also be helpful. Yeah. Kind of depends upon the situation, right? Which again is why there's variation. Okay, so you know, let's look at all the things that conscientiousness is associated with. You know, conservatism, which is kind of kind of what was just said about you know sticking maybe to routine, sticking to what works, sticking to tradition. That could be helpful. It's associated with disgust sensitivity. You know, being more orderly. Well, that can help you avoid you know contaminated food or pathogens if you're more you know careful if you're more um, easily disgusted and um, if you're more orderly and keep a more orderly environment and um, you know harsher judgments of moral transgressions also more you know socially responsible yourself you know if you're more likely to police others and more likely to try and be virtuous yourself then maybe it's less likely you'll be ostracized by a certain community um, you know, they feel extreme guilt when they don't use their time productively. And so they would want to chip in, right? And so historically, you know, those who did chip in and pulled their weight, you know, maybe they were more likely to have high status or reap more rewards, right? They were more likely to be viewed favorably by the community. Whereas those who didn't chip in, you know, those who were lazy and quite happy to sit back and let everyone else do the work, you know, they probably would not have reached or reaped as many benefits, right? And maybe when things got hard, you know, they would be the first ones to be kicked out or whatever. Um, and then it's also associated with our behavioral immune system, which I'm going to talk more about in the fourth module. But that's basically behaviors that we use to avoid contamination. OK, so cleaning one's hands and cleaning food before you eat it and so on. So, you know, David Boss is probably the best known evolutionary psychologist. And his model of personality is basically the same as the, the big five, except he uses surgency as a term instead of extroversion. Um, but it's also about you know, social assertiveness and positivity and so on. Um, and so he's written quite a lot on you know, why the big five might have been beneficial from an evolutionary point of view, but also why there's you know, variation. Um, I think, though, the best paper on this was by Daniel Nettle. Um, from 2006, who not only was able to help explain the, each of the big five, but also why there's variation by listing costs and benefits for each of the big five, because there has to be variation, right, or reasons for variation. Otherwise, every single one of us would be extroverted, okay? If there was no evolutionary benefit to being introverted under any circumstances, then everyone would be extroverted, right? So there has to have been times in which it was beneficial to be extroverted and times in which it was beneficial to be introverted, okay, to explain the full range of the distribution, the normal distribution for each of these traits. And so, for example, openness, you know, some benefits are creativity, okay, explaining why people on the high end survived, but then also it can lead to some um, unusual beliefs, okay, and in some cases, even psychosis. Um, conscientiousness, you know, predicts being hard or working, longer life expectancy, um, long-term fitness benefits, right? Usually more likely to look after themselves physically. Um, but also you can become rigid and quite obsessive, right? So maybe in some cases, that's why those on the low end were able to survive because they didn't have these limitations. You know, extroversion helps with mating success, which was said, um, help you um achieve some social allies um which also then may help with exploration of environment which is what you said margo um 
but actually also extroverts are more likely to suffer injuries and come into um have suffer from physical harm physical risk um agreeableness you know paying attention to others harmonious relationships which you've all said um but also you know if you're too agreeable you're going to be taken advantage of right you're subject to cheating um you're going to be a bit more naive um you won't be maximizing self selfish advantage in certain opportunities so those low in agreeableness in some cases, you know, they survived because they were more aggressive, they were more selfish, and all this paid off. Um, neuroticism makes you more vigilant to dangers, which you've all said, but also it can make you more stressed and depressed and have a number of mental health negative consequences. So in some cases, being a bit more resilient and, you know, less anxious, more fearless, okay, was beneficial. Now, the evolutionary psychologists not only claim to explain why each of the big five have emerged as prominent personality traits and also why there is variation they also claim to explain why there is differences based upon geographical regions okay well maybe again maybe talk about this more in the fourth module but you know some communities are more collectivist in nature okay typically if we look far enough back in their evolutionary history, okay, they came from societies in which food could be hard to come by, in which you know mutual altruism was really necessary for survival. Whereas societies that were more individualistic, okay, what we often find is food was pretty plentiful. And so long as you were skilled enough to take advantage of opportunities, okay, then you could always be fed. Okay, and so that may explain why differences in you know personality based upon culture has emerged. Um, but they also claim to explain why there's differences on average between the sexes, right? Especially agreeableness and neuroticism were the main two that were different across um, or between males and females, right? Um, so from an evolutionary point of view, it's not too hard to imagine why, right? The mother was the caregiver, right? So um, it's to the benefit of the species, right? That she's going to be more compassionate and empathetic and altruistic and have this, you know, maternal care for the offspring. Uh, whereas again, you know, in our evolutionary history, right? The man was the hunter and so on. So it would pay off to be low in agreeableness in many situations, more competitive, okay? More proneness for violence perhaps. Um, but also, you know, sexual selection could help explain that as well right because historically you know men would have wanted to select women who would be more likely to care for the offspring right and women would be more likely to select men who would be able to take care of them even when they're threatened by other competitors and maybe other tribes and so on um, and then you know neuroticism remember the difference actually only emerges when one gets to puberty okay so the evolutionary argument for this would be that you know once the woman gets to reproductive age, she has to be more hyper vigilant when it comes to threats in the environment, because she's not just looking after her own survival, but also the survival of the offspring, right? And so it's you know again to the the survival of the species benefits that she's able to pick up on threats in the environment. Okay, so that would be the evolutionary argument, right? Um, in comparison or in contrast to this. The social role theories would argue that these differences in personality have emerged as a consequence of cultural and societal factors, right? Um, and I told you about this, you know, this these studies um, before. But what these studies found was that the countries that were more egalitarian were actually the countries with the larger sex difference, right? Which the evolutionary psychologists use to further support their argument that there's a biological reason to these differences okay and even if you you know take away the societal bar barriers and if you give people freedom to pursue what they want to pursue there's still going to be some differences because of biology um which isn't what was expected right these psychologists expected to find the opposite that in the more egalitarian countries the sex differences would be smaller and yet the studies have been replicated and replicated finding the same result now, some caveats to this are, first of all, you could debate to what extent any of the countries are completely egalitarian, right? Um, 
but also, you know, a lot of these countries on the low end are countries that are more collectivist, that we know are higher in agreeableness anyway. We know the men in these countries are more agreeable because of some cultural differences. Whereas a lot of these countries on the high end are more individualistic, okay? And so that would explain also why the kind of, the norm for agreeableness is lower anyway, okay? So there might be some confounding variables here to do with you know other differences in culture. Okay, and then you know one last line of research to talk about is um, study on the personality of animals. Okay, now if you've had pets before, maybe you've observed that you know there's differences in temperament. You know, some dogs, for example, are maybe more meek and a bit more. Um, reserved and maybe some are a bit more you know, boisterous um, and ironically even Pavlov observed this he named the, the four dogs in the original study after each of the four humors from the, the Greek model of personality because he observed that there was differences in temperament between the dogs okay um, and I say ironically because you know the behaviorists argued that based upon this research people were blank slates and that their biology had nothing to do with their personality um, but he even even he observed that the dogs, you know, learned differently based upon their temperament. Okay, so you know, a number of researchers have actually looked to see if there's signs of personality traits in other species, not just ourselves. And using the Big Five model, now extroversion, neuroticism, and agreeableness, in some sense, exist across species. Okay, now that's not too hard to imagine if we frame extroversion in, in, term, in terms of a behavioral approach system, right, in which one is being activated to pursue particular goals driven by dopamine kicks and so on, right? Even if it's as simple as, you know, that's food I want, okay, I'm going to go after it, or, you know, there's a partner, okay, um, again, this behavioral approach system, okay, is motivating you. Whereas the behavioral inhibition system is responding to threats, right, causing you to withdraw. Again, we see that across species. Agreeableness on the high end is some cooperation, or on the low end is some um, selfishness or anti-sociality, right, violence, proneness, aggression. Um, and again, we can see these characteristics across species, right. So the, the evidence for that is fairly clear. The other two are much harder to observe, okay. You know, openness is about creativity, you know, appreciating diversity, wanting to experience something novel. Okay. It's not very clear that this exists across species um, to a great extent. And conscientiousness, you know, a willingness to sacrifice the present for the future, okay, willing to be hardworking in order to reap benefits later. You know, you have to be able to conceptualize time in order to have such a characteristic to you. Um, you will see here that some studies have claimed to find some evidence of openness and conscientiousness in some species, but I would argue that they're using conscientiousness and openness pretty loosely in a lot of these studies. You know, conscientiousness is being framed as an ability to persist upon a challenging problem and to um, persist and complete it, and openness is an ability to solve a difficult problem. Okay, and you know, sometimes different animals, you know, can solve some kind of puzzle or maze if they're in the right circumstances. Um, so the kind of main argument here is that, you know, extroversion, agreeableness, neuroticism, even when it comes to beings or species that are pretty simple, okay, there's evidence of these characteristics and there's evidence of variation as well um, of these characteristics. But it's probably the case that one needs to be more cognitively sophisticated, more complex, in order to really have um, these other two traits and for there really to be variation, okay, within the species of these particular traits, conscientiousness and openness. So, you know, evolutionary theory is a very comprehensive theory, okay, it can really be used to explain just about any aspect of human behavior. Um, it also gives a reason behind personality and differences in personality, right, rather than just describing it. Um, there's some support from animal studies and there's cross-cultural support for the five-factor model. Um, but of course, behavior 
behavior is not determined just by biology. And a couple of points to keep in mind is that, you know, adaptations are solutions to problems of the past, right? There is a lagging um, effect, right? And also with that in mind, one is never entirely evolved, right? People are always evolving and, you know, the characteristics that one had in this framework are to do with solutions that, you know, were challenges for that and, and that person's ancestors and their historical past. Um, so, you know, one person is no more evolved than another is what I mean by that. Um, obviously, it's a very reductionist argument, okay? You know, we're coming up with post hoc explanations to explain observed differences, right? There's no way of really testing these, okay? Not scientifically. Um, and yet the attempt to explain everything, right? Okay, so, you know, we've covered a lot this week on Hans Eisnick, Jeffrey Gray, Colin D. Young, temperaments, evolution, genetic studies. Is there any questions before I finish up? Okay, well, if you think of anything, email me. Otherwise, there's no class on Tuesday because you have your exam. Same same rules, conditions as the previous two exams, okay? And then we'll meet back for presentations on Thursday next week, okay? Slides are due by end of Wednesday. Thanks.